everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Ash Wednesday. Um, trying to ruin your Valentine's Day by uh, having a gaggle of politicians come up and talk to you. Uh, but for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Councilman Slife. I represent Ward 17 on uh, City Council, and I want to introduce all of my colleagues, but I also want to give a special opportunity for Council President Blaine Griffin, uh, who came out for this little presentation we're going to do. I want to give him a chance to say hi. Thank you all, first of all, for coming out today. And I always learned a long time ago never to get in front of somebody in their meal. Uh, but thank you so much for allowing us to come out here today to discuss something which we think is very important. And I want to thank, um, I always want to give credit where credit is due. I want to thank Councilwoman Stephanie House Jones. Um, she really led the charge on this, as well as uh, my colleague Slife. You're going to get a great presentation. I was fortunate to share it with my community meeting last night. It is really informative, and I really want to thank them because they led the charge. When you're the council president, sometimes you need to just step back and get out the way and let some of the people that have just as much energy lead. So thank you all so much, and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. So, so the reason we're here today, it is budget season at Cleveland City Hall. And we hear a lot of people that the, the, thinking the budget is this big mysterious thing. It's not as complicated. It's just really big numbers. Uh, but the big takeaway is we're here because we want to share with you what's being proposed by uh, the mayor's side of City Hall and get your feedback. Because at the end of the day, the budget is all about helping you, the residents of the city of Cleveland. Uh, so joining me and Council President, uh, you, everybody knows Brian Casey, Councilman for Ward 16. I know we have a a lot of Ward 16 residents in the house. Uh, Councilwoman House Jones uh, represents Ward 7, which is uh, the Huff neighborhood on the east side. Uh, we have Councilman Kerry McCormick, uh, my doppelganger. Uh, he represents Ward 3, which is Ohio City, downtown, parts of the Stockyards neighborhood. And then also we have Councilman Danny Kelly, who represents the eastern side of West Park and then around West Boulevard, St. Ignatius of Antioch, that part of the west side, kind of the Midwest side. So I know there's Ward 11 residents come here too. Uh, so we're here, there's obviously 17 of us, but we're the ones that were able to make it today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Councilwoman House and she's going to start the slides. If you want to just click with my mouse, that's how it'll advance. Okay, that's good. Cool. Hi, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Everyone is looking so nice, the season of love. Whether you're partnered or not, we all deserve love, so even show yourself some love this day. So like the purpose of this is really just to go over what our budget looks like, and this person, and, the, and afterwards, we really wanna engage in a conversation to get your thoughts, right? What do you see, feedback, yay, nay, type of thing. All right, hopefully. It'll work. Oh, you know what? You know what? Okay, do, do that. Okay. So, um, you just keep. Is it this way? Okay. Would, okay, I'm gonna do that. That one. Okay. So basically, um, many times when we go get into our budget, um, we are talking about the 1.65 billion dollars that the city of Cleveland has every single year to operate the city, right? And we want to talk about how that works, what it goes for, um, and really, like I said, get people's feedback. Because a lot of times we know that people might not necessarily know how it is broken up. The process for our budget is broken down into five different categories. Uh, we had operational hearings. The operational hearings, we had them in the fall of 2023 which this was our opportunity, Cleveland City Council, to talk specifically to directors of various departments and agencies to let them know how are we spending our money, some of the expectations of things we would like to see in the upcoming budget. From there, we have the budget estimate, okay? The budget estimate is where Mayor Bibb, he put out on February 1st, he, his mayor estimate, how much money we're getting in, how much money is going out, and how he feels him and his administration should, should utilize uh, the people's money. From there, we go into budget hearings. So next week, we actually will have a conversation directly with the mayor. From the mayor, we will have a conversation with each and every director of departments as well as chiefs to let them know, getting into these numbers, what should we expect, what are you doing, and what kind of um, benefit will go to uh, Clevelanders. From there, we'll have about a week or so to make some modifications, right? If there are some things that we hear, and the idea was, have we heard some things here that may we might want to change the original proposal that will get us to the, the point of approving the budget? 
list? No? Okay. Uh, things to remember. <clears throat> A, we must have a balanced budget. That means the money that we have in, we cannot spend more money than is coming into our coffers, right? We can't do it. We're not like the federal government. We can't be like the state of Ohio. The money we bring in, we must uh, bring out. We cannot go over. We have to, again, have a balanced budget. This budget must be passed and approved by April 1st, okay? Again, when you hear that number, we originally started, we said 1.65 billion. There is a difference, right? There are two major differences, and the one that most people have the opportunity to have at least some, in, some input in is our general fund. The general fund is our kind of discretionary dollars that come into us, we can make decisions. The other separate funds are the enterprise funds. Enterprise funds are basically the funds where everything is ex exclusively uh, pay for through user fees, right? So think about uh, Cleveland Water Department, the Cleveland Public Power, Hopkins International Airport. All of those things are enterprise funds and are basically self-funded, okay? The, the, we cannot use those dollars to do the general fund, which we'll get into what those things are, basically police, fire, all of those things. Beyond that, there's a separate piece called the Community Block Development Grant Dollars, these are many of the things when people are talking about home improvement, homeless services, things of that nature. That is a separate piece of legislation that is not in the general fund. The reason that is is because that is federal money. It comes from the federal government and we have to go through a separate budget process to do that. But we're now only talking about city of Cleveland money, the discretionary money that we get and how we are utilizing it. And this is one thing we want people to remember. The mayor recommends, but Cleveland City Council, the 17 members of Cleveland City Council must approve it. And so that is a reason why we have to have a relationship, a connection, in order to come to a happy medium on how we are going to um, invest our dollars to do the best we can. The, yes, the, the, well, he, he is the council president. Yep, yep, this is the council president. So now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Councilman Sly that's going to get into details of the general fund. Sly? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I hope everybody, uh, I want to also thank Councilman Stephanie House-Jones and her staff for uh, getting the donuts from Peace Little uh, 11 Donuts up in Cams. If you haven't had a donut, I think there's still some in the back. Uh, please don't let those end up at my house. Um, so again, we're focused on the general fund because as Councilman House Jones said, it's the money that we can make decisions off of. If a new dollar comes into the general fund, we can say, do we want to put that towards EMS or do we want to put that towards recreation? So the purpose of this slide, this set of slides, is to help you see what is being proposed at this point for how all the money gets broken down and then allow us an opportunity to see how we can modify it to make it better. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over uh, being sick last week, so I still have a bit of a cough. I'm not contagious. Um, so uh, just some numbers to kind of set the stage. We are starting the year with $46 million left over from last year. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money. That is a lot of money. That's not even one month of operating the general fund. So it's, it's, it's a carryover, but it's not like we are at any given time sitting on massive piles of money where we could, you know, if, if there was a major shakeup in the economy, we don't have enough money to make it through six months without having to start making some tough decisions. Um, what is being um, estimated as new revenue coming in, and I'll show you where we get our revenue from, is about $780 million that we expect to come into City Hall this year. So the total amount we have to play with is 825. What the mayor's proposed, just a second, I'll ask you to take your question. Uh, what the mayor's proposing is basically $779,000 of expenses, so we end up back with $46 million, as that's, that's what we hope to take into next year if it's passed in this way. That's the $46 million that if we wanted to add things to the budget without having to cut from the budget, that's where we'd be able to do it. It sounds like a lot, but it's not too much. Ma'am, I know you're dying for a question. All right, now we'll come back, we'll come back. So, all right, so I want to first talk about revenue. You got to know where your money's coming from that we, that we use. So this pie chart, this is a couple of pie charts and I'll walk through them because I know it's a little far away. 
<coughs> but the biggest takeaway is that the city of Cleveland relies on income tax, primarily. If you work in the city of Cleveland, it doesn't matter if you live in Cleveland, it doesn't matter if you live in a suburb, you spend 2.5% of your income, uh, you send it over to the Cleveland Division of Tax, and that's where we get nearly two-thirds of our total uh, budget. Property tax, look, I'm going to... I. I hear a lot of people say, you know, we property tax keeps going up, property tax set by the county. I'm sympathetic to that as well, but most of your property taxes actually go to the schools. Uh, property taxes also help fund the county, things like RTA. We only get about 12% of what you pay in property tax comes to the city itself, which is why it's such a small chunk. And then there comes, some, comes to be some smaller things, um, charges for service, um, the local government fund, that used to be a much bigger uh, piece of the pie. Essentially, there was this negotiated deal with the state of Ohio where you pay sales tax, they'd send sales tax back to cities. Uh, the state has over a $1 billion rainy day fund right now, and they basically created that billion dollar rainy day fund because that local government fund, they, they started keeping that money for themselves instead of sending it back to us, which has been frustrating. Um, Investment income, you know, we invest in income rates are obviously up. We know that um, if you get a permit, uh, if you, you're going to a sports game downtown, you pay the admission tax. All of these things add up to that revenue that I showed on the last slide. This is how we're looking to get about $780 million coming in the door. So how do we spend it? Uh, I start with this one because as you remember grade school, there's three branches of government, right? Executive, legislative, and judicial. Same way at the local level, uh, there's the executive branch, which is the mayor and pretty much most of the people who work for the city of Cleveland make up this yellow piece of the pie. It's about 93% of the total budget is for people who ultimately report up to the mayor. Uh, the next chunk is the municipal court. Uh, if you get a speeding ticket or something, you might have met them. Uh, we have to fund that out of the general fund as well. And that little, little small sliver is uh, the elected officials on Cleveland City Council plus our staff. There's 61 of us total. Uh, so we are uh, proud to be the smallest portion of your budget and, and really hope we're getting a lot of bang for the buck. Um, but since that, the, the next couple slides, I want to break down further so you can see this is where it starts to be interesting of how the city is be proposing to divvy the money up. The largest 51.5% in this proposed budget is for public safety. So that's police, fire, EMS, animal control, also costs associated with the uh, federal consent decree. Uh, the next biggest chunk is public works at about 12. Uh, public works is uh, your garbage collection, uh, the division of recreation, uh, pothole patching, uh, um, so, so a lot of a lot of the routine city services you think of that aren't public safety usually fall into uh, that public works category. Um, Non-departmental. Tune in next week on TV20 as we're getting into the hearings because this is an area where we're, there's still a little bit of lack of clarity on our side what they are proposing as non-departmental expenses. Uh, historically, uh, this has been kind of a catch-all uh, for some various things. The mayor is also changing, and this might be too in the weeds for everyone's interest, uh, but kind of presenting to us job vacancies different. So a lot of that's baked into here. Uh, municipal court. General government is the mayor's office, plus things like uh, the Community Police Commission, uh, the City Planning Commission, the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Office of Sustainability. Uh, the uh, general government's a bit of a catch-all as well. And then it starts to get smaller, finance, law, the Department of Building and Housing, uh, the Department of Public Health. And then the smaller ones that you can't see uh, are they're, essentially they're so small the label couldn't get on. There's things like the Department of Economic Development or the Department of Aging uh, or the Department of Community development is in here with a very small fraction, uh, but what's I think worth reminding, and Councilman House Jones had said this, is that the, that federal, those federal dollars, the community development block grant, most of that goes to the Department of Community Development. So out of the general fund, we're really only paying for like the director and a couple staff. Most of the Department of Community Development and those programs are in a separate budget. So it's a small sliver of this pie, but it is not a small sliver of what happens at City Hall. And then I believe this is the last one before I turn it over, but I broke it down a little further because that public safety chunk is so big that this now pulls out the different divisions of public safety. So you can see that just about almost a little under 30% of the budget is in police. 
about 14%, 14.7 is in fire, and then further around you can see under 5% in EMS. So when you break down that 51.5%, you can see that uh, the, the police and fire make up a substantial percentage of our entire workforce. Makes sense that it would then make up a, a substantial portion of the general fund budget. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Brian Casey and talk about the, what, something just to also keep in mind that the general fund is not just money that we're thrown out into the wind. It ultimately is about paying the city workers uh, who deliver the services. So, Brian. Thanks, Councilman Slave. Uh, so there's three uh, forms of government within the city of Cleveland that people are employed are. Legislative, legislative branch, which is your court system. You see 61 people. Um, I'm, or, I'm sorry, the legislative branch, which is Cleveland City Council. Um, we have 61 people employed through the legislative branch. The judicial branch, which is your court system, your clerk, all that other stuff, 426 people. That's who are employed there. The executive branch, which is everybody else, uh, 4,113 people. You see people uh, that are employed by the city of Cleveland, roughly 4,600 people. Uh, and salaries and wages, there's about four hundred and a half million dollars go toward uh, salaries and wages and then obviously benefits come along with uh, being employed by the city of Cleveland that's about a hundred and almost seventy million dollars uh, so total budget for salaries and benefits which is 72 percent of the budget comes to about five hundred and sixty three three million dollars uh, that the city spends on employing individuals Closing comments. Probably to reiterate the, uh, okay. All right, so that's kind of in a nutshell. Now that's a lot of information that you guys got in 15 minutes, um, but there's so much more to it. Uh, and what we want you know, to hear from you guys is about feedback for the general fund or how we spend the money or how you think we should spend the money. But we do want to tell you that when it comes down to that we, we should cut this or we should add this, um, if we add something to the budget, because the number that we've been presented with is a number we have to stay within. So if you decide that you want to cut something or add something, um, know that something's got to give. So if you want to add, or if you want to add more police officers, know that we've got to cut from somewhere else because we have to stay within that allotted budget that the mayor has given to us. So does, does that make sense? Did you have your question? Have you figured out your question yet? I, I, I think we're ready, right, for questions. So if you want to go ahead. Okay. And if you, okay, I know. Public safety. Public safety. The streets. Where's the money for the streets for these potholes at? Okay, so that's two things. So there's public safety, you mentioned that. that is and then you mentioned yeah. streets. Those are two different divisions, okay, right? Okay, take the streets, Steve. All right, who wants to, anybody want to take streets? What's up with the potholes? So which is in public works. Okay. Right, so if we go back. So. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right, we're gonna switch it up and give you a different face for all the questions. So really important question on, on street. So a couple things to answer your question. One, we have street repair. So that's somebody filling a pothole. Sometimes you see a cut in the street where they're doing utility work. That comes from the Department of Public Works funding which Councilman Slife showed you on the screen. The other big thing for streets though is gonna be uh, repaving streets. And so repaving streets, this is a couple things that go on with repaving. There are the state of Ohio repaves some streets, the Cuyahoga County repaves some streets, and then you have local neighborhood streets, right? So your big streets, are gonna be the ones that are paved either with federal, state, and local money, but the small streets are the ones that come directly out of the city's streets budget. So depending on the size of the street, depends on where the money comes from. Can I give an example? Of course. Kinsman. Kinsman, mm -hmm. <laughs> Kinsman got potholes like a semi-truck. Yeah. And I can't even go over there. Yeah, so great example on Kinsmen. Um, so for example, in the springtime when the snow clears and they can get out there, 
The city has crews that go out and replaces the potholes. They can also do what they call spot treatments. So if it is the size of a swimming pool, they're gonna come out and they're gonna cut the road out usually and replace that pothole. But that commences uh, usually when it, the freeze thaws. Okay, because they had said February 1st. And I know it ain't gonna happen February 1st. So. February 1st, yeah. The city work starts March 15th, city workers. This is the city work. Yeah, they patch sometimes with cold patch in the winter time, but really the majority, yes ma'am, a lot. A majority of that work starts when the weather breaks and we know in Cleveland, Because it's know, a lot of them and y'all really don't get all of them. Yeah. Yeah, and so the budget process today, that's what allocates the money to the mayor's administration, and then the mayor's administration will then go forward in doing things like filling the potholes. So really important question, though. Sounds like a plan. Yep. All right, then. Thank you. Absolutely. What other questions we got? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know how much does each city councilman get for their particular ward or whatever? That's a great... I can answer that or I can pass it off. Okay, really, really great question. So the majority of the money um, goes into general services that are not ward specific. So what the councilman just showed you, and that's again, police, fire, EMS, rec centers. Each council person does get a very small overall with the budget amount of discretionary funding. And that comes from several sources. The first one is block grant, which Councilwoman House Jones explained is the federal money that comes down we receive a small percentage of those block grants to use for public purpose. So it's got to go out into the neighborhoods, into the community, and each council member uses those a little differently. For example, in my, I represent um, downtown Ohio City Tremont, a part of the Clark Fulton neighborhood. That goes to places like the May Dugan Center that provides meals and care for seniors and others and, and pregnant women, et cetera. The money goes to um, the Near West Recreation League, which um, is a, a recreation league for children uh, as well. So ma'am, depending on the ward, it's different. Each, uh, out of the block grant, it's, uh, last year it was $437,000 award in block grant. And then there's a casino revenue fund. So the downtown casino, a part of the taxes they pay out of their business goes to uh, the council office. The same thing, it go, has to go out into the community, those dollars. Every quarter, every three months, each member gets about $25,000 of those casino dollars, which to all of us, that's a lot of money. But when we think about the, a project that you want to invest in, those can get costly, so, uh, or services provided. So the block grant, ma'am, is about $430,000 a year. The casino revenue is around $100,000 a year uh, into the council offices. And then there are some other funds that in years past were um, appropriated that no longer are, that some members might have a balance in, but those are the largest funds. Did you have, absolutely. What was my question? Uh, okay. Oh yeah, when they do like, let's say um, raise, when uh, employees get a raise, do they do it across the board or is just some of them they yeah. get it? Really good question. So the question was when employees of the city of Cleveland get a raise, is that across the board or do some folks get it? The answer to that question is a majority of the city employees are represented by unions. And each union negotiates with the city of Cleveland when it comes to raises. So depending on the union, they'll negotiate uh, benefits, they'll negotiate pay and all of that. The city has to come to an agreement with that union and then city council then ratifies that agreement. So it just depends on the union. For any non-union members of the city, generally the city will follow the trends that the unions are setting. So what does that mean? Usually what you'll see with a union is they'll do something like what they call a 2-2-2. Two, two, two. That means a 2% raise this year, a 2% raise next year, and a 2% raise the year after. So that would be a three-year agreement between, between the city of Cleveland and that union that determines those employees' raises. And what the city will do is they'll say, okay, because the unions have set that trend, we're gonna apply that trend to non-union employees of the city. So ma'am, generally it just depends on the union, but a lot of times they track a similar rate um, that you'll see amongst themselves. Really, really good question. I know they had Local 100, but that's no good. Local 100, they're one of the unions that um, negotiates with the city, so. 
Yes, ma'am. Like a private street, and not a private street, but a through street. Mm -hmm. And they put a Dollar General on that corner of the street. Now they have repaved the street, not replaced it, they've dug holes and filled them in about five times. And it's still bumpy now, but it's not a long street. And I'm in Ward 11, so this may not have anything to do with you or councilman or anything, but the street is just bumpy. They just filled in one in front of my house, and it's back the way it was. Now this one was filled in about a month ago, and it's back sinking down. Yeah, so one of the things that drives me up the wall is when someone, and sometimes that's not the city that does that work, that could be a private developer, it could be the cable, it could be somebody, we can find out for you for sure, when they don't do uh, quality work. That drives me up the wall and I have zero talk. So why don't we do this, um, I know your councilman's here today, um, we can get your information, ma'am, on your street and make sure that there's a full inspection of those cuts to ensure they're done properly because, again, nothing gets me angrier than, and I know my, my council members behind me um, agree, when the work isn't done right. You got to do the work right the first place. So if those patches were done recently and they're falling apart already, that's unacceptable. But we can follow up with you, get more information on that. Why don't, yeah, Brian. But there's a difference between a pothole and if the, Street's actually been cut, which is a utility cut, right? Which we, it would be a square thing. And I can tell you that the Department of Public Utilities this time of the year would rather keep that cut for a couple of more weeks and then wait for the, um, for the, um, the hot patch to come through because it's, it's more of a permanent when you, when you do it with hot patch. So at this time of the year, if it's a utility cut, then they're going to wait probably just a couple of weeks until the hot patch is ready, and then they'll they'll fill the the utility cut in with the hot patch. Okay, I I, I do know the difference. Okay, I've been on this street for forty years. Okay, so I'm I'm just I'm just throwing that out for in general. I'm not saying, yeah, John, did you? Oh, who? Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I've been a lifelong resident of the city. And I've been reading recently a lot about the stadium projects being proposed and land projects along the river and the lakefront. And uh, a lot of the billionaires know how to make money and ask the city for it all the time. Uh, we've been through this before, uh, over the decades, and it seems to always be the same old game plan. Uh, they come to the city asking for money, there really isn't the wealth creation there that we're told is going to happen. Uh, any economist can tell you that. And so, uh, in my opinion, uh, and I think I reflect the views of a lot of citizens, uh, there shouldn't be any more money given to these billionaires. They've already had enough. We have enough chuck holes and serious problems in our city to deal with. And I think that's a reason, that the fact that we've been giving them monies and tax increment financing over the years is a reason why our population continues to deteriorate. We continue to lose jobs. Our representation continues to dwindle. And so I'm for giving them nothing and giving it to the people. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I to say something. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really important point. Um, so what, what, what I love about this process is we get to be able to see the data, the facts, the numbers, and, and I just want to make sure that we're all clear on the facts of the budget. Number one, so I was involved, for example, with the Quicken Loans deal. It's in my ward and, and I represent downtown. Um, folks don't understand that zero dollars of the general fund went into that deal. Zero. And so what we used is a thing called admissions tax. So when the stadiums were built in the 90s or 80s, 90s, I wasn't around when they were built, um, they had created something called the admissions tax. And what that is, is for folks that go to games, that use the facility, they pay a portion of their ticket into an admissions tax that is put, into, put back into uh, the building for re rehab and things like that. So for example, for that, 
uh, agreement, the admissions tax was leveraged from the city's perspective. There was, I think, some state and county as well. But from the city's perspective, we used admissions tax to invest back in that building. So not a penny of these dollars went into that deal at all. And I think one of the important things when the conversations go around with the Brown Stadium is the same commitment the mayor and council have said it is that it cannot touch the general fund of the city of Cleveland. The city, when the Browns were brought back to Cleveland in the late 90s, owns that building. Whether that was the right decision or not, that was a decision made 30 years ago, um, and the city owns that building. So there's that whole conversation. But what's really important to remember is that when we talk about things like tax increment financing, what that is, is it's added value after a project is built. If you don't build the project, there is no new revenue. So if you say, don't build that project, don't build that new business, there is no revenue anyway. So number one, um, I fully support the fact that general fund dollars should not be used in stadiums. Um, and I, you know, that's something that I know that most people will agree with. And so the dollars that go into those potholes, into those chuck holes, to pay for police, to go into recreation centers, are not impacted. And I think that's a fundamental value that council members agree with because we deal with those calls every single day. It's the vast majority of our calls. So if there's ways to say, hey, the money generated from that stadium can pay for itself so that we're not tapping into city resources that pay people's salaries or fill chuck holes or other things like that, are we able to do that um, and then look at other ways through, um, you know, through the admissions, part of the admissions tax, through what you saw up there, which is the uh, bed tax and the hotel sales tax that fill our general fund, that comes from hotels, stadiums, and things like that, that help fill that pot that patches potholes, that hires police officers. So the point is, it's a complex issue, but the general fund dollars that go into every day-to-day -day services um, should not go into the stadiums. They did not for the Q deal. I would recommend to make sure they, they do not for the Brown Stadium as that conversation progresses. But things like tax increment finance, it is the added value that the project itself creates. If you don't create the project, there's zero added value. Um, and another really important thing to note, and this is a policy decision that the council president holds and I agree with, when tax increment finances are passed by the city, they're called non-school TIFs, which means zero dollars for our school systems are impacted by those. And actually, because there is added value in the project, more dollars flow into the school system. So the point is, is that in a city like Cleveland that we've lost, I, I was born and raised in the city of Cleveland. I grew up on Ward 8 on the east side. I live in Ward 3 now. We've seen many uh, large influx out of our city. A lot of that has been due to historic redlining, people not being able to get loans. A lot of that has been due to suburbanization, which every city in America has dealt with over the past 70 years. There are many reasons why population loss has occurred. Achieving goals like locating jobs in the city for our residents to access, achieving goals like creating financing tools to build affordable housing. You know, folks forget that a lot of our low income and affordable housing also will get things like tax increment financing and tax abatement, which makes the projects happen. Those are the types of things, safety, ensuring that we're hiring enough police, fire, and EMS that keep folks in a city. So again, I saw my neighborhood uh, between 185th and 156 uh, lose a lot of population. You know, and that was due to a lot of reasons. It wasn't due to a new business uh, opening up in the city or downtown. So it's a complex issue, but we've got to protect the uh, general fund budget that pays for those general services and make sure that every time that we invest, is there a return on investment for the city of Cleveland? I think that's incumbent for us to answer. I don't know, President. And Councilman McCormick actually summed it up, so I won't rehash uh, what he just said, but I want to give you this breakdown. And Pat, first of all, thank you for your years of service. I was just asking, I said, why don't I see you around City Hall anymore? And I guess you, this is where you hang out at now. Okay, but anyway, thank you for your years of service in building and housing. Uh, let, me, let me say this. The other, only other thing that I would add that Councilman McCormick um, did not state, because he did a very great job of articulating how this works, bringing revenue in in order to run a city. You got to bring in money. The city does not run off of fumes. So the income tax is what's important because when you get those workers at some of these different places, they go into income tax. Now, to your point, 
One of the things that council, and, and let me give you a couple of breakdowns first. 50% of the city's revenue comes from the central business district. That's where the taxes are generated. 25% um, comes from the Eds and Meds district, which is around Case Western Reserve, um, you know, Cleveland Clinic, all of that uptown district. Then you have nodes like the airport, and you have a couple of other factory generating places that generate revenue for the city of Cleveland. That's what pays the, deal, the bills, ladies and gentlemen. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, uh, but the money to pay the bills to run the city don't always come from the money that's generated here. The other thing that I really want to pay attention to what Councilman Slife said, which is very important, all of those workers, no matter where you live, have to pay 2.5% in taxes. So 83% of the people that pay the city of Cleveland's tax base don't live in the city of Cleveland. So a lot of times we are bringing in people from outside of the city of Cleveland to pay into city of Cleveland coffers that help bring in revenue that helps take care of neighborhoods. And even though I will pivot to this, we have done several things like community benefits agreements that are attached to economic development deals so that we can make sure a percentage of the jobs as well as some of the other benefits that a community may need, like if it's um, painting homes or putting money into a land trust like they have in the Huff neighborhood or other things like that. We always work with the developer to try to have extra benefits. So when you hear about some of these uh, places downtown, one of the things I spent probably two hours this morning doing is trying to say, hey, we need to accelerate the growth so that neighborhoods can see a benefit if we are to accept a deal in order to make sure that neighborhoods get a significant portion of the money that's generated after we pay, in, pay down the debt for some of these projects. So it, it's, 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 it's a lot of economics involved in that, and all of us are continue to learn as we go, but rest assured, everything we do, we try to make sure we advocate for money to go to neighborhoods. And when I say neighborhoods, downtown is a neighborhood too, so I don't do that downtown versus the neighborhood, but you know what I mean when I say edge, middle, and distressed neighborhoods, which are basically the neighborhoods that we're in now, okay? So we do try to do some of those things to try to redirect more money when we do those deals, but that's not the sexy stuff that the paper likes to show. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, I got a, a question on paper, and it says, "Would how um, basically how are we going to fix the pools at Department of Recreations?" <laughs> That's one question, and then it was a general thing about don't increase our property tax. So I'll take that afterwards. You go ahead. I'll I'll just start with the pool and say at this rec center, so this has been a source of frustration for Councilman Casey and me for a number of years. I've been on council a little over four years, and I would venture to guess 90% plus of that time the gunning pool has been closed. Uh, for one reason or the other, the, the heater was broken, uh, there was some leaking. So if you walk up the stairs, because you can't see it from the window now, you can see where they actually are digging out this pool now and fully rebuilding it. And I will say, uh, I, I like to think that that happened because Councilman Casey and I brought out the mayor's chief of operations and said, look, you keep doing all of these uh, stopgap projects on this pool, but if you don't do if, if the pool needs a new liner, the pool needs a new heater, the pool is leaking, and if you only do one of those, the pool's still going to be closed and it's a waste of money. So I am happy that this pool is hopefully, if we stay on construction schedule, uh, December of this year, uh, we'll have a new pool uh, here at Gunning uh, inside. Uh, the other thing to comment on pools, and this has been a source of frustration for us, is even when you pivot to the summer, uh, we've had challenges in the past with lifeguard staffing. Uh, so we've had instances where, say, you go to the Impet Park pool, you're expecting it to be open, and it's closed because there's, not, there's no lifeguards. Uh, there have been some movements, it seems, on the administrative side to uh, increase training, uh, be able to increase pay, and, and we're hopeful that that, 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 that that shortage resolves itself. But, and before I pivot over to you, one of the challenges we have, remember there used to be almost a million people in Cleveland. There are more pools per capita in the city of Cleveland than in New York City. So one of the things that we are constantly having to contend with is we have 
far fewer than a million people, but we have the infrastructure for a million people. So we are constantly having to figure out how to make tough decisions uh, to figure out what pool to invest in, what street to resurface. And something that I will say I've asked for and I still haven't received from the administration, uh, let's use streets for an example, we know how many lane miles of side streets we have. If asphalt lasts 30 years, theoretically, you can do a quick little equation to figure out every single year, this is how much money we should be putting towards streets. And what we end up getting from the administration is, this is how much money we can put towards streets. And there's a big difference between can and should. And I'll say that I've been trying to do more, more digging on my side to understand what does it actually cost to operate the city of Cleveland to all of our expectations and how far off are we on revenue right now? And then I'll pivot it over to you. You had something else to add on to the question. So um, there was a question about making sure we do not increase property taxes. So we're gonna just try to share this with. So the city of Cleveland is not responsible for increasing property taxes. Um, that really is a function through our county that does the assessments, which is guided from um, um, our, our laws here in the state of Ohio. And so this is the thing that we were talking about, right? We wanna attract you know, businesses. We want property to, um, uh, the, the, the value of the property to increase because many of our funding streams from our schools in particularly are funded through our property taxes. At the same time, we know a lot of people's income is not increasing with a lot of the opportunities, right? So what we are trying to do while we're trying to, um, working to attract new businesses, new residents. We are also trying to work with the state of Ohio, which is a state policy, to really think through some policy solutions to really try to hold people harmless, especially our seniors. When we know when you get into the retirement years, you know, that's it, right? You, 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 your, your income, your incoming earning potential has really stopped, right? And so really trying to work with our state legislators to see how we can make that possible. We have not gotten there yet, but there are continually to be a coalition, not only in Cleveland, but we have places in rural Ohio who are dealing and experiencing the same type of economic press from property taxes. Um, I think I will do a shout out if you are, have not uh, signed up for the homestead exemption. Um, this is a, a um, this is a program that those who are are aging, um, who are at a certain age, you can make sure that you you get a discount on your property taxes. So please, if you not, we can get you connected with that um, to utilize that service. In the meantime, we definitely have to work with the state of Ohio um, to make that uh, a reality. The other thing that I want to say, as we talked about the need to have more lifeguards, uh, last year I believe we only had 60 lifeguards, 60. 60 lifeguards to, exactly, and we have at least 20 plus pools, okay? So three lifeguards, when it's dozens of people, we need more people, um, individuals. And so if you know any young people, young adults, some seniors, whoever, who, who would be willing to go through the training, uh, the city of Cleveland has um, some, some summer hiring events. Um, we really would just like to partner with them because we know people want to be in the water, but we can't do it safely if we don't have lifeguards. So if you know of young people, who will teach you how to swim, will get you certified, but we need the actual workforce in order to have pools open. Um, and, 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 you know, I know we got, I think we've got 11 people more trained, but we need more, you know, we need over 100 people to properly, safely staff pools, and we need your help to, to get us in that direction. I know, young, uh, there was a question back there. Yes, sir. Um, but 2015, there was a study called Migrants and Neo. Um, done by Hyman Morrison's group. And it came up with three conclusions for the regional, for the Northeast Ohio, Greater Cleveland region. And it basically said, if by 2040 we do nothing as far as changing and working on intergovernmental uh, regional solutions to our problems, whether it's East Cleveland or West Lake, um, we're going to have major problems. The three scenarios um, said, one, if we make substantial changes, how we do things and how what we're doing is with the region perspective in mind, while maintaining a lot of individual entities, we'll do fine, we'll grow. 
The middle solution was it's just going to be adequate and we'll, we will slide by. The other one was we were going to implode. We're going to implode under our own infrastructure. Whether it's Avon who depends on expansion to be able to grow, keep on growing to be able to pay for what infrastructure happened 20 years before. What I think we're talking about, and this speaks to what you said, um, is that we're imploding gradually under our own infrastructure, right now, physically under the ground. We don't have a plan. We know we have a, a infrastructure of a million people. We only have 400,000 people. Now, on top of that, we have empty office buildings in the downtown. That's going to reduce our general funds substantially. I think that we need to address this. And I love council right now because you guys have stuck yourself out there for creative financing for that was controversial, whether it's a TIF or it's um, um, tax abatement. Creative solutions on how to manage neighborhoods and how to manage tax abatement. A TIF that's controversial, that's making money. Uh, when that doesn't come from the general fund. We need to be able to have systematic planning where it comes from beginning to end. Whenever you take something up, it needs to be a system way of thinking about it, which is, say, digital C. 15 years ago, Digital C was sort of proposed. We got all these telephone poles that CPP bought from um, the utility, the illuminating company. They were gonna put um, um, nodes, Wi-Fi nodes all over the city. It never happened, but what I learned during that period of time that there's substantial contracts for uh, communications for the fire, the public works, there's all these were going to go on to those nodes. So when you're planning something, say digital C, we're going to give you gradually more money. How else can we use that long term? How can we as a city make ourselves more efficient in our planning? How can we think about we have a good So I'm going to interject. So I, no, 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 no. So I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. So I'm actually definitely going to have uh, Councilman Casey talk about Digital C and kind of what that flaming is. But I understand the thing that you are talking about. How do we have government reinvent themselves, right? Because that's basically what you're talking about. We have these systems, right? The city of Cleveland, we were created in the year of 1792. We are 232 years into this experiment of local government. When you are getting organizations, how, how, how can you get the city of Cleveland to work with East Cleveland or Westlake and things of that nature? There are many, um, I would say many of us are now becoming more active to learn who our municipal colleagues are. So if you have, um, it's the Northeast Ohio uh, Council Association, the Ohio Municipal League, National League of Cities, these provide opportunities for us council members to not only build relationships with ourselves, but, re but build relationships with our other colleagues in other municipalities. You're not going to work or try to solve so solutions with people you don't know. And I know that is a lot of the work that we are doing so that we can figure out how can we be innovative, how can we think about 
our collective power so that we can ensure that our cities, not just the city of Cleveland, but Northeast Ohio, um, can be competitive and vibrant for everyone. Um, I would say we are definitely making much more strides to be more collaborative in nature versus competing with, with each other because what happens to, to Cleveland happens to everyone. You see what I'm saying? And a lot of times, for a lot of for too long, a lot of times when people are like, oh, that's a Cleveland problem, right? But we are learning, you know, year after year that we are all interconnected and it's a lot of work being done to build the divides that have happened literally over generations, right? We're trying to overcome that to have relationships so that we can like provide better for not better for our city as well for this region. But I'll pass it over to uh, Councilman Case and you talked about Digital C. There was some work that Cleveland City Council kind of led the charge to ensure that these investments that we are having, how they can um, not be failed out opportunities, but go into things. And I apologize, I do have to get back downtown. Yep. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Um, just in regards to Digital C, uh, Cleveland City Council took $20 million of our ARPA funds and came up with the idea of doing broadband across the city. So we partnered with Digital C and make a long story short, within 18 months, every single resident in the city of Cleveland, if Digital C lives up to their obligation, will be able to have internet access for $18 a month. That's kind of it in a nutshell. So that, John, is, is one, of, one, of, one of the initiatives that, right, I, I know you knew that, um, is one of the initiatives that council took to make sure that we take care of uh, I know everybody talks about individual wards, right, and about where we live, but you have to understand that even though you're represented by a councilman of your ward, we still have the responsibility of making sure that the whole city runs, uh, you know, from Collinwood to, to West Park down to Old Brooklyn, right? So, anybody else have any other questions? I have one. Yeah, Bessie. Okay. KZ and go to Slice. Thank you. Are you all gonna help us get the carpet clean here? I'm, I'm just saying, we've been doing this since last year. I'm just asking. We seen you, we really I thought a guy was coming last year to do it on Good Friday, so I'm gonna try it again. The th theory behind Good Friday is that no one's here, so we can kind of put stuff up here and, and clean it. But but yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know the last time it was cleaned. Yeah, I think it's good. So, I want to thank everyone who was able to stick around. Uh, we're going to stick around and we're happy to engage more. Uh, I don't want anyone to feel like they're captive to us right now, though. So uh, we can wrap it up. But, but the, the, the big takeaway is we are trying to uh, go out of our way to hear from residents because we want to uh, answer questions about the budget, kind of make it uh, demystify City Hall. Uh, it's not that complicated. I figured it out. It's easy to explain. Uh, but then also uh, go through the added effort to make sure that as we get into our budget hearings that what we are conveying back to the mayor and what the budget we finally do pass uh, is, is meets the expectations of the residents of the city of Cleveland, uh, which is who we work for. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thanks for letting us crash. Uh, grab a donut on the way out, and we'll stick around. <laughs>